Since we're going to be talking about medications that relieve constipation in this chapter, the very first thing that you need to do is to make sure that you understand what the definition of constipation is. Laxatives are the most frequently abused medications because of the fact that people don't know the actual criteria for constipation. The Rome criteria for constipation involves having at least two of the following in any 12-week period. Firstly, fewer than three bowel movements per week, hard stools in more than 25% of bowel movements, a sense of incomplete evacuation in more than 25% of bowel movements, excessive straining in more than 25% of bowel movements, and a need for digital manipulation to facilitate the evacuation. So the person needs two or more of those before being considered to have constipation. And the next step to really understand our medications is to make sure that we know about the foundational information, the anatomy and the physiology of the area, the pathophysiology or dysfunctional physiology, and then we can place the details of the medication into the context of all of that. So that's what we're going to do right now. The gastrointestinal tract has two layers of muscles, the circular and the longitudinal layers that are controlled by an extensive nerve network called the enteric nervous system. Those are all pictured here. The circular muscle layer is right here. The longitudinal muscles are right here. And the neural network is over here. All through the small and large intestines, there are also glands that secrete mucus and other substances into the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. The muscles are like any other muscles. Their job is simply to relax and contract, but in a way that keeps the contents of the gastrointestinal tract moving. So for instance, if there's a blockage or a perceived blockage in the gastrointestinal tract, the muscles before the blockage will relax and contract more vigorously and much more mucus is secreted. All of that is in an attempt to remove that blockage. The intense contraction occurs for a short period of time and then that eases off, starting a cycle until the blockage is released. The reason that happens is because the blockage is perceived by the nerves and they in turn automatically respond in that manner. And if there's a bacterial infection in that area, the nerves sense the damage that's occurring in that area due to the toxins and respond again, increasing the motility of the gut and secretions into the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. So the motility of the gastrointestinal tract is influenced somewhat by what's happening inside the gastrointestinal tract. But there's also other factors as well. For instance, one of the main factors that affects the motility of the GIT is the autonomic nervous system. That's the portion of the nervous system that we have very little control over. And its main function is to keep all of our organs functioning in a way that best suits our needs at the time. So the sympathetic nervous system dominates when we're fighting or fleeing. When there's an emergency situation that requires us to shut down the digestive system so that we can attend to the more important things at that time. And meanwhile, the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest system, the one that increases the motility of the gut and increases the secretions into the lumen of the GIT. And so what causes constipation? A number of factors will influence that. Firstly, the person may inherently have decreased motility of the GIT or decreased secretions of the mucus that aids the movement through the GIT. Also, any medication that mimics the sympathetic nervous system, remember the fight-or-flight response that shuts down the gut, 
or decreases the parasympathetic nervous system, remember the rest and digest system, those can all cause constipation. Those medications act directly on the enteric nervous system to decrease the movement of and secretions into the GIT. And another example of a group of medications that gives the person constipation is the group called the opioids. And we'll see in the later chapter that those directly affect the nervous system to decrease motility. The contents and consistency in the gastrointestinal tract is also important for optimum motility. The contents of the GIT needs to be broken up. We need something to break up that contents, like the fiber. And finally, there needs to be adequate fluid. For instance, not drinking the ideal amount of fluids can, in itself, cause constipation. And also, even a well-hydrated individual can have constipation if they don't respond to that initial urge to defecate. In that case, what happens is that more water is reabsorbed from the large intestine, and that'll dry out the fecal matter. Another important thing to remember is that constipation can actually be a symptom of a health issue that's really important to address. For instance, constipation can occur as one of the first symptoms of hypothyroidism and other disorders. Finally, before any recommendations are made for any problem, it's important that all of the safety issues of that condition are known. For constipation, it can lead to hemorrhoids, anal fissures, it can lead to decreased release of toxins from the body, but most importantly, it can lead to intestinal blockage. Laxatives are contraindicated in intestinal blockage. Let's apply that information that you just learned. We said that when there was a blockage in the GIT, the muscles before the blockage will relax and contract much more vigorously and mucus is secreted. All of that is in an attempt to remove the blockage. The intense contraction occurs for a short period of time and then it eases off, starting a cycle like that until the blockage is released. And using that information right now, I'd like you to attempt to predict the type of pain that is associated with that blockage and any other symptom that may be reported by a person who has an intestinal blockage. So try to predict that. There are three main symptoms that stand out when there is an intestinal blockage, and I didn't expect you to predict all three. But even if you just attempted to predict the symptoms, you did really well. So well done. Firstly, you were right if you said that there would be a colicky pain, the type of pain that comes and goes in waves. So a short period of cramping pain and then a bit of time that there's less pain. That's what happens in a hollow organ. Another thing that happens is that a person may complain of small volume mucus-like diarrhea. So why would a person get diarrhea when experiencing the worst possible constipation? Well, the reason is that as the blockage occurs, that's going to prompt the release of mucus from the area, and oftentimes the mucus is the only thing that gets through that blockage. And finally, there may be a significant distension of the abdomen. But remember that all of these symptoms may not be present in all people, but they are the ones to pay really close attention to. When you're trying to remember the symptoms of anything, you look for the most specific things.